kind of helps you understand how you're viewed by others. Uh, right before getting up here, I received a text from John. He said, can you use the sound recorder in your phone to double for your sermon, or should I? And of course, I responded, you, I'm ignorant. And he responded, okay. So, <laughs> ignorant it is. Uh, that's the way to go. Anyway, we're glad you're here. It's third Sunday. I have it on. I've got it all the way on. It's on and on. Everything is good on my end. So maybe you just have to do something off this. And I'll try to stay close to that. Just this morning, Adam was saying, I really hate these lapel likes. And uh, now you know why. Anyway, last week we began a new series entitled Hope, Heritage, Unity, and, uh, and Freedom. And we talked about how we got here as a religious movement. Uh, and how important that is. And what we learned was that the name Church of Christ isn't so much a church or a denomination as it represents a movement that took place in America. And it was built upon some very peculiar and new and radical pillars that for their day was so progressive that people were actually put to death for forwarding these kinds of ideas. The five main ones that uh, we looked at basically is that everybody should be able to read the Bible for themselves. Number two, that no government should interfere with people's practice of their religion in terms of bringing their life under the control of Jesus Christ. And number three, the sacrament of communion or the Lord's Supper should be open to everyone. There shouldn't be a test you have to take and you shouldn't spend your time trying to separate who the truly faithful are, from those who just they think they are, uh, by deciding who should or should not be able to participate in communion. And number four, and this is one of the writings of Alexander Campbell as he set things on, 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 on his way, is no doctrine that comes to us uh, through the expediency of, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm not expediency, uh, but that comes from an inference or a human deduction through logic and other things should be forced or be allowed to be forced on the consciousness of others who are not yet there. In other words, if your faith is up here and you're able to understand Greek and a bunch of other stuff and you come up with an idea, uh, you don't have the right to make that the, the test of fellowship for people who just aren't there yet. They're still trying to figure things out. And fifth and lastly, no expedient practice that falls into the realm of becoming a tradition or just our way of doing things should ever be allowed to cause division in the body of Christ. Now that's part of who we were. As a religious movement began to sweep across America uh, shortly after and even during uh, the American Revolutionary War, uh, uh, War. And so what we want to do is kind of look at how these things, our heritage becomes our hope and we can build unity and understand and express freedom in Christ from a biblical standpoint uh, by looking from where we are, where we're at, and what's happening around us. It's very, very, very important today. So what today is we're going to be looking at the assembly. Okay? You're in it right now. If you don't know what the assembly is, you're in it. Next week we're going to look at the table, what the Lord's Supper is all about. And you'll get a hint today. Uh, that's, I'm sorry, that's not true. Next week uh, the lesson uh, come down to the river. We're going to be looking at the role that baptism has played uh, and, and what the power of the water, not only just in baptism, but how the imagery of water goes throughout the body, whether we're talking about the blood, crossing the red sea, crossing over the Lord, and all these other images that are part of it, what that means. And then we'll look at uh, the imagery and the idea of the sacrament of taking the Lord's Supper. So, this is where we are. And the idea behind this is this is a very special moment. This is when we come together to assemble as the family of God. It's special. But what we don't talk about so much is that it is sacred. And by sacred I mean that, well, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But it might be more special and more sacred than you've ever imagined. Our name, Churches of Christ, has become somewhat of a brand name in American religion today. 
In some areas it's lauded, in other areas it perhaps is tarnished. But that's not why we call ourselves the Church of Christ. Some will say that we call ourselves that because it's in the Bible. Romans 16, 16. You can, get, you can even buy a license plate. It says, Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. The problem with that is there are lots of churches. There are all kinds of names for God's people coming together in the Bible. But we chose the name Church of Christ because when that name was chosen by the Reformers or the Restorers of that time, it was a term that was used to mean all believers. The other term you might be familiar for that is with is the term Catholic. Not Catholic as in Roman Catholic or Orthodox Catholic, but Catholic, Catholic as the universal church. In other words, the association and the binding together of all believers. That is what the Bible calls the churches of Christ. And that name is chosen because that's what our movement was all about as we talked about last week. So we are believers that gather here every Sunday. Now, if you're visiting with us, I want you to hear this because this is important. All we are saying is, is that we are believers in Jesus Christ. We're not saying that we're the only believers in Jesus Christ. We're not saying that we're the best believers in Jesus Christ. Or that God likes our belief better than He likes anyone else's. We're just Church of Christ. We're just believers. And that name includes you. If you're here today as a believer in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what religious heritage that you have come from or even if you haven't come from any religious heritage, you are welcome here. All of us. These are our roots. This is the heritage, I think, that we should celebrate. If you're struggling with your faith, you're welcome. So are we. We struggle all the time. If you're struggling with sin, so are we. Come struggle with us. There's not a sin that you can struggle with that hasn't been struggled with by families in this church. That's just all there, or that we're struggling with right now. All we are saying is that we are the family of God gathered here as imperfect people, and this is our special time. If you're visiting here from another church, Church of Christ someplace, you might look around and say, you know, things are a little bit different here than it is back home. Well, here's how that works. Everything changes. Everything in the universe changes. And if you think that a church should never change, then you would have to believe that the church is the only place that God ever created that He didn't intend to change. That's what life is all about. And that's what movement is all about. As a matter of fact, if you don't believe, think you like change, uh, go look in the mirror. Uh, I don't understand how they design bathrooms like that. I mean, why do they want 25 of the world's brightest lights around the bathroom mirror? I'm telling you, the first thing in the morning, the last thing I want to see is my face in that mirror. I mean, you kind of reach a point in your life where you just look in the mirror one day and you say, well, this is as good as it gets right here. It's all downhill from now on. And so when I wake up in the morning, I think I would rather stub my toe than turn on a light, I think, sometimes. Because, in fact, there's no way to get around the fact that things change. And for you younger people that look at some of the practices that happen in church and think that's old school, what you need to remember is everything that you think is old school used to be used to be brand new. I remember when I first became a Christian, I grew up not going to church anywhere without a female. So I started to come to church for all those songs. I remember some of the songs kind of creeped me out. There is a fountain, a brook of blood, flows from the Emmanuel Bank. Everyone who's loved some of these things, we can all get this one. We used to sing a song to take up 
your sickness to be well. I've never felt the need to tell you that. But I have. Ruth and Naomi Ryan had a sunset on the street in Buffalo. Now, you got to see this song. What goes on in my heart is what matters. And then we sang it at night. that way with our God. He is alive. When I was a teenager. But everything that's old used to be new. And everything that is new will be old one day. But what we're trying to do is to create a place where believers can come and connect with the sacred. Which is hard for some. But it's what the world needs, I believe. A sense of the sacred. Now let's be fair. For many of us in our religious tradition, we are rooted in an intellectual faith. That is, believe these things and do these actions, and that's your contact with the gospel. I was taught the gospel that way. Here are the five steps. And here are the things you need to do. And you need to do this because if you'll do these things, then you are at peace with God and God is at peace with you. But that doesn't work. In any other kind of relationship. But I've tried. I've tried to ask my wife to stop and pray for me three times a month. The things that I need to do to keep her happy and to be living in the same house. My wife is not a registered gun owner uh, because it doesn't work that way, does it? It doesn't work. Your children, if they came to you and said, Mom and Dad, And so to try to boil down the concept of meeting God to a list of requirements really is not safe because it's not a loving relationship. And this is what we want to communicate here tonight. Our relationship with him needs to be a loving one. And so without the sense of the sacred, we run the risk of becoming like many churches I observe. Now, give me a second here. I'm, I'm not being negative. I am sharing an observation. Being negative when you say, you've got to stop doing this and this and that. I'm, this is just my observation. Because I've been asked throughout the years to consult with several elderships and visit many churches and to try to help them get out of whatever deep loopholes they were in and try to find some way that they could do it. And what you find is that a lot of churches are what people might call spinning tires and putting out fires. That's what they're in the business of doing. And they're in the business of trying to make certain people the problem with being in the business of trying to make other people happy is, is it never really ends. I have a friend who also deals with churches that are in crisis, tearing themselves up, messing themselves up, and on more than one occasion, the advice that he has given to those churches are, you need to go out and change your name. situation to where your job is to keep a particular group or a particular family or a particular person happy, you're no longer connected to the sacred. And it's very, very difficult to gather as a people and hold to the promise that God has something bigger planned for us if we just find ourselves in the business of trying to And that's what this assembly is all about. And so our assembly then really is what I want to call a sacrament. And that's what I want to talk about for the next three weeks. Now a sacrament is the means by which God gives us grace. That is the theological definition of a sacrament. Now we don't use that word very much because we don't believe in a lot of who they are. But a sacrament 
by theological definition, is the means by which God gives us grace. In other words, he pours his love out on us, and he gives us grace. Do this now to expand that a little bit. By faith, God gives grace through, now this is what we believe, and we really don't ever express this very much. God gives grace through the material symbol by the power of the Spirit through whom we participate in the future. In other words, baptism is a good example. We just don't throw people in the water. We tell them, I'm now baptized in you. And by the authority of Jesus Christ, through the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, for the remission of your sins, and we put them in the river. The idea behind that sacrament is that we are made material people by the power of the Holy Spirit through whom we participate in the future. We're alive now with God and we're going to live with God in the future. Amen? We do the Lord's Supper. We participate in the Lord's Supper through the power of the Spirit. We ask God to change us and help us to reflect and to remember. So this concept of what it is to be sacred, this is the place then, and this is the time where we receive the presence of God and we celebrate the inbreaking of the future into our lives, into our present life. And I believe that people are hungry for that. And I believe everyone wants to have contact with the sacred. Now our heritage is born of three L's. Law, logic, and law. Gave us the system of natural philosophy that basically said that everything could be figured out intellectually. But without the connection to the sacred, you just end up with bits and pieces that argue and hold together. And I don't think that's what God wants us to do at all. Now, I know that there's some of you here that are very religious. And you don't want to be out there with the sacred. build a church by saying we do this practice, this practice, this practice is kind of like trying to build Frankenstein's monster. It just really, really doesn't work. And if you build a church with nothing more than rituals and practices and traditions, you don't have the presence of God. What you end up with is a church that's merely a social club, a social organization that will split itself up And that's all there is to it. So what do we do? Well, what we need to do is to come to God and ask for the sacred. He gives us the table. He gives us the water. And he gives us the assembly. And what we're going to be doing is looking in Hebrews chapter 12 for just a little bit today. And I will try to hurry, although I will try. Hebrews chapter 11, everybody knows that. Faith Hall of Fame. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Noah did this. By faith, David did this. All these other kinds of things. And then Hebrews 12 follows Hebrews 11. And the Hebrews tell, uh, but what Hebrews 12 is telling you is not that you meet your heroes and super saints there, but that you meet your heroes. That's what makes that such a powerful, powerful thing. You don't have to come down. But God doesn't have to come down and tell us to come up some mountain, he says. But he tells us that we have a sense of community. So let's look and see what some of these things are saying. Now this is the end of chapter 11, picking up in verse 39. And all these, that is all those heroes, Though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had promised something better for us, and apart from us, they could not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, 
let us <coughs> lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let me go on and say a few things about how this pertains to our life. Let's back up. He says you are surrounded by such a great a cloud of witness. A cloud of witness is a And they've been with us the whole time. Well, sometimes we just really don't even want to acknowledge that. They're not up in heaven. They're down with us. And they've come down, and we are surrounded by them in this place at this time. It's not that this place is a holy room. First time I ever got in trouble in church was for sitting on a communion table. You would have thought I'd knock the Pope's hat off his head or something, but a guy just stole a communion and said, well, listen, there's nothing holy about that. makes this a holy place is the presence of the sacred with us. Not a place where a box that we try to keep the sacred hidden away from the rest of the world. And it's not like it was. He goes on to say, what you need to do is you need to discipline yourself and you need to get ready to take your place among that great cloud of witness. So whether the Lord tarries or he comes, you will be a part of the faithful Holy Ghost throughout the ages that will be a part of the family of God forevermore right now. And it's not like it was in the old days. You are coming to a holy mountain. Not like that old mountain that just scared the wits out of everybody. Picking up in verse 18, he says, uh, For you have not come to what may be touched a blazing fire and darkness and gloom <clears throat> and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice who words that made the hearers beg uh, that, that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not have endured the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying that sight, uh, Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion. You've come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to the innumerable angels in festive gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to a sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. God calls us to come together and to worship in a community of saints now and to be with those heroes now. And when we gather, heaven gathers now. Not saying that when we come here because God says to, what I'm saying is, is that when we assemble as God's people, heaven joins us. They want to be here. I was 18 years old. I spent the summer in Ufala, Alabama, in the Baptist Baptist Church. And God was so faithful to me. And I always had this picture in my head of this great cloud of witness that was all around me.
service to him. When you go to the book of Revelation, you have a need for the Lord to see you. The difference between the church and the world is this. act of faith. It's a community brought together. And they are angels are breaking out in song. It's modeled in different ways. And this is what we are all about. And you see this. And every once in a while up in heaven, you get one of those people up there saying, go out and do something. Well, I wonder how many of you will say, well, I'll just sit here. I'll be up in the cutting room singing and praising God. And I'll be sitting with the people I've known and heard from them for so long over here. And they're going to come up and say, it'll be a bunch. They'll say, hey, we're singing a new song. There'll be a bunch of people that come behind me and say, oh, that's awesome. bear witness to the reality of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus sat and read Psalms to the people. Why do you do that? Why do you do it? Because God joined His people in worship. The future comes soon. So, the assembly is safe. I think I've made that point. Number two, the assembly is necessary. God never says he'll save us alone. Even the Lone Ranger needed contact. So he built community. Jesus builds community. We are a community. Every book in the New Testament, except Philemon, is written to the church in Philemon. Every book in the New Testament, except for the one that Paul wrote to the church in Philemon. Jesus came, what did he do? He built community. Everything about it is about community. You read the story of the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, and it's Jesus and the risen and resurrected Lord God and his community. Here's the other part of this. Over 300 years after the Lord had been gone, after the dead had been restored, after they had come away from the tomb, and they were well pleased with him. Why? Because God is with us when we are in community. People say, well, I stopped going to church because church failed me. Congratulations. You failed them too. I'm telling you as someone who's hung in there 
supposed to be seen, but God is with you. Besides, if everybody in this church was perfect, we wouldn't want you. (laughs) Uh, People don't, anyway, just think about that. You put money in the plate because someday it might be for you. You put, you go and visit the sick because someday you're going to be sick. It's about community. It's about you. Number three, I've got to hurry, hurry. I'm not impressed with one another. I love this idea. God did not call you to accept a person of faith. Show me your life to a person of faith. I want to see you live your life to a person of faith. I want to see him in the New Testament. That he says, I'm going to want you to make me your person of faith. You just can't make it on your own. It's not about being on It's about being part in the body, a place only you can fill. It's kind of like you got going up to a volcano. There's no, or it's like a snowflake. You know, scientists say there's no such thing. What happens? You reach up to the top. You shut the top off. Nothing in and of itself that's part of the body of Christ is impressive on its own. That's why we have community. Hebrews chapter 12, the first three verses, I'm out of time, i got to hurry. Tells us we have a place in the community. We're not alone, we're surrounded. Verses 4 through 11, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be easier for you than it used to be for them because you know more than they did. Chapter 12, verses 12 through 17, stay with the community. You are a target when you're alone. You're not going to make it. Don't sell your inheritance like Esau is. Don't go out and get mad. So I'm going to start my own church. I'm going to have people around me who agree with me. What kind of world would that be? Crying out. Don't you want some variety in your life? Don't you want some spice and some artistry in your life? If we all have to be alike and think alike and do everything just alike, I don't know what that is, but that isn't like my family. My family looks like some kind of gypsy circus around the world in 80 days mess. That's what my family looks like. And I don't even, I'm just talking about me and my two kids. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, all families are that way. Families are messy things. They're difficult. And you just don't walk out. Anyway, 18 through 24, blessings of knowing Christ and walking with him. Verses 25 through 29, warning of dangers for not staying with the group. You say, well, that's legalism. You stand to be at church. No, I'm giving you the summation of the sermon that was delivered in Hebrews chapter 12. Legalism, and you say, well, what I'll do is I'll take one or two of my buddies about the golf course and we'll say a little prayer from the tee off. That's what we'll call it. And we'll call that church. That's legalism. Legalism is when you say, well, I can leave early as long as I don't leave by myself. Legalism is being a passive observer, not connecting with the saints. Oh, there's so much more. In your community, who do you want to be? Pray with me. Second Kings chapter. is telling him not to go the way he's been going. Right? So, okay, what we need to do then is go see a prophet. And so an army comes in. And they're surrounding the house of Elijah. Elijah comes out and he says, God will make a way for himself. He sends a chariot.
reason I'm a little mystical or thinking about my life and where I'm supposed to be. When I was a student, 20-something years old, I had a teacher by the name of John Maltin. John Maltin was a professor here at the University of Kentucky. And John was a incredibly smart man. He was a writer. He was a poet. He was a poetry teacher. He was a professor of poetry. And he told me about a man called the Reverend Henry Ford. says, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't go see him. I don't go meet my son at the cemetery. He said, what Hebrews 12 has taught me is that my son comes to me to be sent to him, God's people. Every Sunday, I sing with my son. Every Sunday, I pray with my son. Every Sunday I take the supper with my son. And I do it as a witness that we will do this again together throughout all eternity. We gather as an assembly. It's true that God is here. Paul is here. Rahab is here. Mary Magdalene is here. John the Baptist is here. Daniel the prophet. So are the babies that we watch. The soldiers that are there. The missionaries who have given their lives. For our loved ones who have gone out. We meet them here. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We are here. This is what we do. This is why this time. Holy God, our Father, we pray that as you hear these words now, that as your great cloud of witness, Father, surrounds us, Father, we pray that our lives will be encouraged, that our hearts will be determined to be people of peace, people that belong to you. Father, I pray that you would be with us, be on our hearts, and help us, dear God, to express joy and praise. Father, to be happy, to look forward, to every week being able to meet our future, to be together, and to have your grace poured out upon our lives. And ask this in Jesus' name. We'll close now with a song. Stand.